Hi guys, today we're going to go over some presentation tips um, and, you know, uh, different ways that you can put the um, collection project one together. Um, even though it's going to be completely up to you, um, there's sort of, you know, some good tips and some things to avoid that I want to go over and this should clear up a lot of questions on uh, sort of what I expect to see um, uh, for your collection project one. Of course this will be uh, an in tandem video uh, with just the collection project one video which will explain and show examples of a collection project uh, when it's due, when it's going to go over, um, uh, what it includes, what it requires and things like that. Remember that this is due October 6th um, and we will subsequently have an open critique which I'll talk a little bit about um, coming up. All right, so let's get into it. Now you have a lot of freedom to sort of put together the collection as you want and you're going to sort of do it the way that you like best, um, the way that you think is the best way to present your looks. Um, but of course there still are some, you know, requirements and um, things that we should be adhering to. Uh, for example, you know, we still need it to look nice. We don't want it to look bad. Um, you can't just make it messy. Um, so we're going to go over some of those things that we should um, look at and some of the things that uh, students sort of go uh, a little bit awry on. So the first thing is sizing. Keep the overall size of each presentation element between letter size, so eight and a half by 11, and uh, tablet size, so 11 and a half by 17. The reason of this for this is you don't want them too, too small because of course we, as a physical presentation, you know, when we're putting it up on the board, we want it to make an impact on its viewers. And if you make it too teeny tiny, it's just too small to make a nice, a uh, sizable impact on the audience. They want to be able to see it easily um, and sort of have that nice impact uh, with your visual elements. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to make it too big. Now, the main reason is um, just simply because it's not easy to carry around. Now, obviously, if you're doing a fully digital presentation, this isn't as big a, of a, an issue. And also, you're kind of limited by screen size. So um, even if you are doing it digitally, um, you're sort of limited to what you can fit on your screen. Your screen gives you your kind of format size to work within. Um, a lot of students sometimes when they're doing their first presentation, they'll go out, they'll get one giant huge poster board um, and just put everything on that. I highly recommend not doing that because again, um, it's just, it's difficult to carry around. Uh, it doesn't look very uh, professional. Uh, a lot of times the elements kind of get crowded all on one piece. Um, and it's just sort of clunky and oversized. It doesn't fit into a portfolio well. It doesn't ship well, won't scan. It's just difficult to work with. So for an example of that, you don't want to do what's on the left here. You don't want to do this sort of giant poster board thing. This is very difficult to carry around with you. Remember, this is only one project. So if you have this big sort of board for one project, by the time you build your portfolio, you could have 10. Then you have 10 of these giant boards. You're lugging around to a job interview or to a client uh, meeting or something like that. And it's just, it's clunky and it's not so great. What you want to do is you want to divide up the different elements of your collection project into separate boards to keep it neat, keep it separate, and keep the size manageable. Easy to carry, easy to store, um, easy to ship if necessary. The next is to keep it professional looking. We want to move away from this type on the left, this type of presentation on the left, which is I call the science fair presentation style that uh, uh, you might be familiar with from high school or middle school and things like that. But that's just precisely it. It looks like, you know, an elementary school science fair kind of project. You don't want that. You want a professional looking, uh, slick layout. Uh, over here is very nice. They did a very lovely job with all of the elements. They have these uh, wonderful sort of border lines. Um, it's a slick, 
clean presentation, uh, visually appealing, it's attractive. Um, uh, again, the composition is quite nice. We have these just very minimal kind of organizational elements here to sort of tie everything together and make it finished and clean. So we want to be aiming towards something that looks like this, not something that looks like this. Keep everything on or in a board, and I'll specify what I mean by that. So for in a board, don't have any element of your project kind of peeking past the borders of your board. So you hear, see here they have these you know, little pieces of the picture. You can barely even see the actual board they're using underneath, and all these little elements are peeking off of it. Now this goes for any element. You shouldn't have fabric swatches sort of uh, draped off the bottom of a fabric board. You shouldn't have mood images peeking over the edges of your uh, um, board. And you should not have your fashion sketches, if you decided to cut and mount your uh, sketches, you should not have like the head peeking off the top of the board or the feet um, dangling off the edge of the board. Now the reason for this is it simply does not look nice. Um, it looks messy. And it looks like you did not plan your space well, which of course you want to avoid. The other reason to not do this is um, the board actually acts as like a protector for all of your elements. And little bits that sort of trail or fall off the edge of the board um, when stored and, or going for travel tend to get folded or creased or kind of beat up or even ripped off over time. So um, if you want to keep your elements looking nice, you know, keep your fabric swatches from wrinkling or bunching up, keep your mood images or your sketches from bending or ripping, keep it cleanly mounted on a board. Um, have all of your fabric swatches neatly cut and mounted. So this is what you want to be aiming for. Everything is nice and neatly cut, neatly arranged, neatly mounted don't want to have just a ball of uh, messy fabric scraps and call it your fabric board and absolutely have it mounted. I've wait, seen way too many students come in with just a ball of messy swatches and call it their fabric board. Do not do that. That doesn't look nice. <clears throat> now, we're, while we're on this subject of uh, mounting everything on a board, um, again, your sketches don't have to be cut and mounted. I know that was a very popular method of doing it in um, sketching uh, 11, FD 11. However, um, although it's a very nice way to keep things clean and neat, and you don't necessarily have to think about overall composition until you get to that mounting section, um, it's not my personal preference. And again, if you don't do this and you do it fine and it looks great and that's the way you want to do it, absolutely fine. That is absolutely fine. Um, at the end, if your presentation looks good, um, uh, you know, as, as per your presentation requirements for the collection project, if it looks good, it is good. So if you decide to do your sketches, cut them out and mount them, that is perfectly fine. However, I say that it's my personal preference not to do that because the cutting and mounting takes an awful lot of time. Uh, my personal preference is to simply plot out everything very carefully on the medium I'm going to work with um, and then sketch cleanly and neatly. Um, and of course, it takes that extra consideration because I don't need to be t terribly neat if I'm just going to cut the, the um, uh, sketches out. I don't need to also plan out the overall composition of my board if I'm doing that because I can do that after it's been cut and when I do the mounting. So it takes a little bit of extra planning, but overall it takes much less time. Now this is also important to note that you must do this if you're going to do that, you know, not do your sketching and mounting, cutting and mounting, that you must use an appropriate stock paper to draw on. Um, if you're doing this on flimsy marker paper or even you know cheap sketchbook paper 
um, you will have to mount it because you don't want to um, present any uh, element sketches or otherwise on a flimsy piece of paper. It doesn't look nice. It doesn't um, stand up. Uh, it's not durable. So in the same essence as you want to protect these presentations for a long time using a nice um, stiff stock of paper. Uh, something that, you know, when you hold it out by a corner, shouldn't flop down. Uh, anything that where you hold it by the corner and it simply flops down uh, is too thin a stock paper to consider using as a final board element. Um, so you do have to use slightly thicker stock paper. I am a big fan of doing my uh, sketches on uh, Bristol board or like Parsons paper, which is a, a thick stock paper. Um, uh, I personally like a lot. Uh, I talked about it doing a demonstration on that type of paper, I think one of the first days of class. Um, but of course, if you are in the situation where you don't have that uh, paper, or whether you just simply um, uh, don't work cleanly or organized when you sketch, then you will want to cut and mount. Um, now also when mounting elements like sketching and even fabric and things like that, there's a couple things to consider. So um, when mounting images or flats or sketches, the best thing to use, and I'm going to show you what I like to use. I'm going to pop over here on the internet real quick. Oh, uh -oh. showing you all my, my business. Um, I like to use a spray adhesive. Okay. Now you can find these guys pretty much anywhere. Um, they're not too expensive. Um, they can call them spray mount or spray adhesive. And basically it's an aerosol can filled with like a glue. And this is what, you know, photographers or anybody that needs to mount anything professionally will use. They will not use tape. They will not use, you know, um, like gooey liquid glue or anything like that. This is really what you want to use when you are mounting, um, anything uh, you want to look professional. And the way you would do that is um, you would say I want to mount a sketch on a board. I would take the sketch that I want to mount. I would place it um, face down on some newspapers or I use scrap fabric because I always have apparently a lot of scrap fabric lying around. And I spray that underside evenly with the spray mount. Then I'll pick it up and place it carefully on the board where I'm mounting it and smooth it out evenly with um, a, a ruler or e just with my hands or something like that. Now be careful if you use a lot of pencil. Um, you want to be careful on that step so you don't smudge your drawing or anything like that. But in this way, all elements will be mounted evenly securely you won't have any you know a little hand or foot sort of flopping off um, and also the problem with using uh, glue is a lot of times if it's not a very very thick stock paper that you're using the glue will kind of make your sketch paper bubble and warp and and almost discolor it sometimes um, and I'm also very much against using tape as a mounting um, it's very messy um, and it really doesn't work very well. You put a couple pieces of tape and it will stick in the tape areas um, for a little while at least. It tends to fall off within a short amount of time. Um, and then all the other elements sort of curl up. And any part that can kind of curl up off the board is prone to tearing, prone to folding, um, and will wear away very easily and quickly. So again, we want to avoid that. A little tangent on what to use um, when mounting and how to mount it. Uh, one last note is when you're mounting your fabric to always leave a little bit of it off the board. So this is a little bit counter to what I just said, but people in fashion like to feel. So be able to pick up a fabric piece off the board a little bit, sort of rub it between their fingers, stretch it a little bit to see if it has a little bit of stretch, how much stretch. Um, uh, kind of play with it to see how it drapes. Is it limp? Is it watery? Is it stiff? Is it full bodied? Um, so a little bit of that swatch. So uh, take this example. We say this, this little top part might be mounted solidly to the board, but this bottom part will be left 
free to uh, free hang so we can pick it up and kind of play with it with our hands a little bit. And we really like to do this in fashion because it gives us such a better idea of how the fabric uh, will fall, how it will stretch, just the nature of the fabric. We're very tactile people, especially when it comes to our fabrics. We really like to um, touch it and get to know it. Layout options. So like I said, it's going to be up to you guys how you organize all your elements. But I'm going to show you a, a few examples and um, you can sort of pick and choose little elements that you like, um, styles uh, that you like that will work for you. Now, one of the probably most often used in the fashion industry is doing every look singularly with uh, their fabric swatches, those fabric swatches used in the outfit sitting right next to it, along with the flat views. Um, this isn't the best example because they don't have the front and back views, they just have the back views. I guess they're using the front as the front examples, but that's a terrible thing to do, especially because a lot of these elements are being overlapped and you can't see. So you would never, this is obviously a student work because in the industry you would always have flats for front and back uh, uh, along with the sketch. But this is quite nice. It's an easy way to organize it. And in the industry, it's very commonly used because we will obviously come up with uh, many, many sketches that don't always make it to the end collection. So for all of our, op you know, potential uh, looks in a collection, we'll, we'll create one of these and then we'll edit it down, edit it down. And it's very easy to do that because we can pop in and take out looks very easily. It's it, if we did it all in a collection, all of them together, it's very hard to take out looks um, uh, from sort of an overall presentation like that. And of course, this is quite nice too, because when you have a separate fabric board, although not wrong, it can be difficult to sometimes relate, oh, what is the fabric to what? So if I had, you know, oh, sorry about that, um, a separate fabric board sort of say over here with all my fabrics, I might be a little confused as to what, to go, what goes with what looks. Um, but in this instance, I know exactly all of the fabrics utilized in what looks, because they're just sitting right there, right next to it. Same thing with if you do your uh, flat sketches there. Now you can do this, of course, you're, you can pick and choose your elements. Um, having the uh, fabric swatches, flats, and sketches all on one board might get a little crowded. So it's fine if you want to do, you know, one look with just the flats, one look with just the fabrics next to it, or just one look on its own. Um, again, it's going to be up to you. It's going to be uh, up to how you want to present things. Um, and at the end, of course, uh, uh, whatever looks good is good. Now, another layout is all having all the sketches together, sort of grouping your different elements of your projects together on a separate board. So for this instance, this person would have put all of their sketches together on one board. Um, have that as a standalone uh, element. Then they put all their flats on one board as, a, as another board and a sort of standalone element. But of course they go with these ones. These flats don't go with this. I'm just sort of showing it as an example. Um, and then have all your fabric boards on one, one separate board and have your mood images on, on one board and keeping all the elements separate uh, like so. Um, the advantages of that is it's very easy to keep organized. Um, it's very easy to sort of look at each separate element um, uh, on a whole. Um, and what I really like about this, I think is the biggest positive, is having all the sketches together really lets you see the collection on a whole. It lets you see one look flow into another, flow into another, and how the entire look, uh, uh, or the entire collection of looks um, sort of appears together and, and you get that sort of impact of all the work looks working together as a sort of full unit, um, which is quite nice. You can also combine different elements as you wish. So here we have, you know, a couple sketches um, uh, combined with their flats, combined with maybe a little whatever fabrics are used here and they'll probably, you know, they're doing a grouping of three. So you kind of get best of both worlds. You get um, what the sketches might look like together, sort of complementing each other, um, uh, and then also having their flats and fabrics. Um, so they're basically grouping all of the elements 
in, into smaller little presentations. So you might have two looks kind of together, two looks together, and then, you know, or two or three together, um, cause you have five looks. And again, if you guys want to do any more uh, of anything, I'll uh, give you extra credit. So um, always keep that in mind too. So you'll pick sort of from those different layouts, you mix and match or kind of adhere strictly to them. Again, it's gonna be up to you and at the end of the day, so long as it looks clean, neat and professional, I don't care what kind of layout style you use. Now we're gonna move on to presentation tips. So you are going to have to pre present uh, your collections in front of the class via video conference, which I'll go into a little bit more detail after this. Um, but let's go over just a little bit of presentation tips. So this is just a sort of rough public speaking um, uh, advice. So use confident posture and demeanor. Um, this, you know, gonna be a little difficult over a video conference, but whenever you give a presentation, you wanna use open body posture. So stand up straight, uh, gesture openly towards the audience, make eye contact with your audience. Um, really deliver it uh, clearly and confidently uh, with your um, uh, audience. So again, stand up straight, gesture openly, keep an open, confident posture, avoid posture that is nervous, is slouching, is um, uh, self-conscious, things like that. So you don't want to give a presentation to the floor, avoid crossed or uh, body language, which can be closed off, um, avoid turning your back to the audience, um, uh, um, avoid looking at notes overly, um, uh, speak confidently, fluently, and openly to your audience, uh, things like that. So. Think about that, especially it really makes a huge difference in um, the sort of emotional and social connectivity that your presentation has. And remember, so you're just giving this to your class right now, but this is practice because eventually you're going to be giving this at a job interview to a client, um, uh, all these different aspects where you really have to convince and connect uh, with people about your ability and your uh, quality uh, related to your presentation or your collection. And having good body language habits will make this a lot easy, uh, easier. Avoid being overly nervous, which of course is easier said than done, uh, but nervous habits, uh, sort of tickings and, and um, looking at looking at the ground or fidgeting or things like that um, are, are really signs of nervousness and remember that emotions are uh, contagious so if you're nervous and self-confident your uh, the people that you are presenting to your audience is going to pick up on that nervousness um, that that you know lack of self-confidence and be nervous and not so confident about you and your presentation as well. Know your presentation, know it in and out. It's your little baby, so you should know everything about it. Always be knowledgeable about your presentation and be prepared to answer any questions. So you, this is always good to practice with someone, give your presentation to someone at home or even your cat or dog or um, goldfish or whatever you got at home, uh, just to sort of practice it out so you know what you're saying, you know how long it's gonna take, and it's all, everything is always easier the second time as well. Um, be knowledgeable, so know, know about your fabrics, know about your customer, know about all those little details and always be prepared to answer any questions. This includes questions that you don't readily know the answer to. This is when uh, making stuff up on the fly uh, comes into play. Now, uh, of course, uh, you should answer reasonably, but if there is something that, a question that is asked that you don't immediately know the answer to, do your best to sort of divert or give some sort of reasonable answer. I don't know is never a good answer to give when you're giving a presentation of something that you created. It makes it look like your creation was not well thought out. 
So if you do get a surprise question, do your best to give some sort of answer. Um, also, be excited, confident, and positive about your presentation. Like I said, emotions are contagious. So if you are excited, confident, and positive about your collection and your presentation, it is much more likely that other people will be too. Um, and of course, you created it. So you have to be its biggest advocate. If you are not excited, confident, and positive about it, why should anybody else be? Keep verbal explanation short. Don't bore your audience. Don't go on and on. So a lot of times when people get nervous about their presentations, um, they'll go one of two ways. They'll either try to talk very short and very quick and leave out information, uh, but they'll also go the other way and talk too long and talk in redundancies. So they'll say the same thing over and over again, or they'll say things that don't need to be said. Uh, and they'll tend to take a long time. And a lot of people just are kind of verbose. They talk a lot. Uh, but this can tend to bore your audience. That is not something that you want to do. And once we sort of verge on boredom, then we start to verge on annoying. So that neither of those things are a very good thing to impress upon your audience. So always try to keep your verbal explanation short. Uh, these are visual presentations as well, so most of what needs to be explained should simply be apparent with the visual elements of your presentation. So what should you say? You must inform the audience and don't simply list what's in your presentation. Describe what can't be immediately inferred. What do I mean by this? Well, a lot of times, a lot of students will come up to do their presentation and nothing new is learned by their verbal explanation explanation or presentation. They simply list what they have done. They'll stand there and say, well, this is my first look. It's a skirt. It's a jean skirt. I paired it with a pink top. The pink top doesn't have any sleeves and a v-neck. This is my second look. My second look is a dress. Now, and that goes on and on like this. Now, unless I am blind, I can see that your first look is a skirt, it's jean, it's blue, it's paired with a pink top. You're not telling me anything new. Um, so because it's so redundant, it becomes boring. And again, I'm not getting anything out of what you're telling me. I can already see very clearly what is used uh, to create that. So when you do your presentation, do not just describe what you did. That's boring and it's not giving us any new information or important information that can't be easily seen with your um, presentation. When you're giving your presentation, focus on these questions instead. Who is your customer? What is your price point? Most importantly, most importantly, because again, who your customer is and what your price point can kind of be, should be able to be inferred by your uh, presentation. I should be able to see through your models and designs kind of who your customer is. Um, although there can be other, you know, details that are, are left out. But again, mood board designs on a whole and um, the figures you've chosen should tell me who your customer is. The fabrics that you've chosen should tell me what your price point is. Um, so focus, again, there should be a little, could be other little details that are beneficial to add within those. But again, most important, most important is probably this third question here, is why does the customer want to buy your collection? That is the most important information that you are going to verbalize in your presentation. How does it fit within your price point can also be further explained. And then again, very important, why is your collection special? Special in relation to your competition, special in relation to fulfilling your customer's needs, so on and so forth. So again, when you're doing your presentation, I do not want you to stand there and simply tell me what is on your board. I can see what is on your board. Tell me why what you put on your board is something special that your customer wants to buy. That is what you need to communicate. Okay, 
So that's a sort of roundup on what, you know, tips and tricks and, and hopefully things that will help you prepare for your presentation. So let's talk a little bit more about how everything's going to go down. Um, I will post this on uh, Blackboard, but all of your collections are due on Monday the 20th and images of your full collection. So that will include your 15 thumbs, your five sketches, your accompanying flats, and your moon fabric board should be emailed to me by class time 1020 on Monday the April 20th, okay? However, we do not have time for everybody to present on that day. So we've broken it up into three days of presentation. The first day on Monday, these people will be presenting, okay? Now, this still means that everybody is going to be required to attend a open critique via Blackboard Collaborative. Blackboard Collaborative, if you haven't used it yet for your other classes, is a video lecture uh, geared toward classes, uh, classroom experience. So what will happen is everybody uh, the morning of each of these dates will be emailed a link to join in uh, to a video lecture in which they will participate in open critique. And again, I reiterate that even though only these people will be presenting for, for each respective day, the entire class is required to attend these open critiques. They will begin at the beginning of our usual class time, 1020, on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Now, they'll run about an hour. Of course, that's our class time. If we don't have time for anybody to present, um, we'll have a roundup day where anybody who, who wasn't able to present them the day that they were um, uh, will present on that alternative day, which will happen the following week. Um, we will present in the order listed here, which is alphabetically. Um, if you have any questions, um, uh, please let me know. Now, I'll be sending out links on how to join uh, uh, in email, so check your emails. The morning, um, I'll start a little bit early so people can get used to sort of the format. There's always a few technical glitches whenever we're doing any kind of video conferencing or video lectures. So I encourage everybody to log on a little bit early. I'll probably start at 10, um, but we will begin uh, in, in earnest at 1020. And so everyone shall have uh, their presentations ready to present and we will have open critique. And this is why it's important that everybody attend each one of these open critiques because again, to get the best and most thorough critique, we need inputs from the most amount of people. More heads are better than one. We want to know everybody's opinion to get a nice, uh, full idea of um, what is working and what is not working for each one of our classmates. Um, and it'll also be required for you to participate in these critiques, of course. Um, and again, if you have any questions about anything, please let me know via email. Um, and I'll do my best to let you know. All right, so um, look out Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning for uh, emailed instructions on how to um, join our open video lecture critique. Um, and good luck, guys. Again, if there's any other questions, just let me know. Um, I might not be answering emails quite as uh, promptly as I have been uh, over spring break, but I still will be around. I'm, you know, all my plans got canceled, and as I'm sure yours have too. Um, so I'm going to be around, but um, email me anyways. I'll be answering emails. Um, just it might be uh, a little bit longer, so I've been trying to get my email turnarounds pretty quickly, um, but over break might be just take a little bit longer. Um, so any questions that you have, or if you want to just sort of show me where you're at for some input or advice, um, always open for anything like that. Um, so let me know. All right, guys, have a great spring break and I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye-bye.